got yeah. a bunch of them. A little bit, yeah. For this very special episode of Unbeatable, I'm going to go down memory lane with a guy that I have the greatest respect for. Walt Zakowski and I got a chance to meet each other back in 1996, and I have been on the sidelines his entire military career as one of his biggest fans. But Walt and I are today are going to talk about the best ranger competition. In fact, there is no human being on the planet that knows the best ranger competition better than Walt does. And if you're not familiar with this competition, if it sounds like I'm not really interested in this military event, let me just tell you, before you ignore this episode, what you're going to hear from Walt will be very practical advice about how to handle all of the challenges of life. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over and I'm just going to start talking to my buddy, Walt Zakowski on this special best ranger competition episode of Unbeatable. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Hey, Walt. It's great to see you, man. How you doing? I'm doing good, Jeff. Good to see you too. We talked on the phone recently, but I was just thinking, I don't think I have seen you. I don't think we spent time together in probably more than 10 years, if, I, if memory serves correct. Yeah, I think the last time I may have seen you was probably at Best Ranger 2013, the last competition yeah. I competed in, either that or 2011. So for us, man, we're just going to catch up on this one and hang out like old friends. But for the audience, Walt and I are going to just totally nerd out on the Best Ranger competition. That's what we're going to do for the next uh, few minutes in this entire episode because you are, uh, Walt, uh, I've already said this to you. I think I am the world's biggest fan of this competition. And what I love about it is what it brings out of a person, especially on the second and third night of it. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a quick story and then I want to hear your start because if I remember right, the first time I ever met you in person was probably either 93 or 94. And when did you start competing? Was it 94? No. So, so we, we, we officially met in 96, the year that you won with, uh, Isaac Damaso. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I enlisted in the army in 1994 and okay. of course I had to go through all of, you know, one station unit training airborne, yeah. rig, spending 10 months at the time before going to ranger school. So I, my, I was 96 was my first competition. That's what uh. we did. I remember seeing you in the train up and for whatever reason, I thought that you and Gamalza were kind of hanging out together in 95 or earlier. And then the following year, I stole your partner away from you and won it is basically what I was going to tell everybody. But thanks for ruining that whole joke. Uh, happy to, happy to. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did get a chance to get to know each other and work really, really closely together in 1996. And then I've, man, I've watched you from a distance. I've been the guy, I, I don't put on the cheerleading outfit and I don't carry pom-poms, but I've been the, like your biggest cheerleader on the side of the competition, watching you go for many years, man. Um, what put it in your head because let's just get real for a second there is a bit of a lore about the guys that compete in the best ranger competition for most of my first few years in the army it always felt like those guys are way beyond what i will ever be so what put it in your head to even try this thing in 96 you know i feel fortunate maybe it was providence but when i when i was in basic training um our company commander was ranger qualified and it just so happened that, you know, my, my cycle of one station unit training there at, at then Fort Benning, now Fort Moore, was in the springtime. I, I, I came in in February, so it was like March, April by the time we were wrapping up uh, the AI advanced individual training portion of BASIC. Anyways, this company commander, Gret, everybody in that BASIC training company of his that had a Ranger contract, and he took us on a Saturday out to Todd Field. and. Uh -uh. Let and let us watch Ranger stakes. So wow. they, 
we had a drill sergeant that just said, Hey, everybody with a ranger contract, get over here. And I thought it was, you know, time for some more uh, physical training just, <laughs> just to get us ready. <laughs> and, uh, no, they, they loaded us up in a truck and they took us out there. And then the drill sergeants were kind of supervising us. They said, Hey, you know, get your battle buddy teams. You can walk around and watch all these events. And I just remember going out there and, uh, and watching that event. And, and I think, Primarily, he took us out there because one of the drill sergeants, by the, uh, a guy by the name of Frank Hall, who's pretty legendary. Oh, yeah. We're going to uh, talk about Frank in just a minute. He, he was one of our drill sergeants, but he was we didn't see him during the whole cycle of training because he was out training. Uh, other than seeing him road marching and in, 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 in the day that we did rappel training in basic, he, he was actually out there doing Prusa climb and rappel. So uh, a lot of it imprinted on me before I even got to the to rip or ranger battalion. So what year was this? They took you out there in basic training to the second day of uh, the best ranger competition. I, I don't I didn't I don't know that I knew that at the time. And I, frankly, I don't think I've ever seen that happen before or since. That's incredible. What year was it that you showed up to day two of best ranger? That was 1994. No. So yep. I was out there competing in 94 with Aaron Weaver um, and trying my best with uh, um, one team from 2nd Ranger Battalion that frankly should have won that year, doing our best to try to lock up first, second, and third that year. Um, mm -hmm. And then it all came down to kind of the last two or three events that separated first through fourth. Um, Aaron and I, Aaron Weaver and I came in fourth in 94. Um, obviously, I was so physically exhausted that I don't remember seeing you or any of your basic training buddies walking around on Todd Field on the second day of the competition. But Dude, man, that's, that's cool that, to know. That wouldn't have been your focus at all. Um, I have always felt like the level of athleticism, the quality of the, the competitor um, for the best ranger competition was far beyond my abilities. Um. I started watching Best Ranger when I was pretty uh, new to the Ranger Regiment. I think I'd only been in the unit for about two years. And uh, one of my platoon sergeants was competing that year. So I showed up and I started watching it. In fact, I tried to act as kind of like a support team for him and his partner. Um, and this was back in 1989. So this is the year that uh, Fitchelman and Sunshine won from 3rd Ranger Battalion. And that's when I learned what this competition is. And the more that I learned about it, the more that I thought these guys are miles away from any place I will ever be. And I never considered, I always felt, felt like the dudes who even sign up for this thing are out of my league. So now I'm going back to your question or to my question to you, you're in second Ranger battalion for a couple of years. Most dudes would say the same thing that I did, like out of my league, I'll never be able to do it. What caused, if I remember right, you were a specialist when you tried this thing the, yeah. uh, in 96. What caused you as a specialist to even give it a shot? Because I wouldn't have thought about it at that point. Yeah, you know, when I, when I, when I was in basic and I first saw that thing going on uh, on day two at Todd Field, it, it, it left an imprint on me. Um, you know, and, and before I came in the Army, I, I played college soccer. Uh, I was a pretty decent athlete. I knew I wanted to come in and be some sort of you know, Ranger, SEAL, Green Beret, whatever. I wanted to do something in the commando lane and I wanted a life-changing experience. And, and so when I saw that, that competition, it just, it struck me as this is the perfect blend of athlete warrior um, demonstration going on here. And this looks like something that I really want to do. The whole journey for me of joining the service was, was a lot about changing who, changing me as a person through experiences that I, that I would get uh, as a ranger in this case. And I was like, that is the next level. These guys are the next level. You know, it I really hope, is. I hope I can, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be in that pool of, of people that are serving at that level. Man, um, for the listener out there, the whole reason that, that I'm talking with Walt today about the best ranger competition is because there are only a couple of men on the planet that have the kind of knowledge of the competition that Walt has. And in fact, Frank Hall and probably Eric Turk are the only two living human beings on the planet that know the competition, have given as much to the competition as you guys have, far more than I have. Um, I remember seeing Frank Hall, just a quick aside, in 1996, I was running around the track on Fort Moore, uh, Fort Benning at the time. And 
Frank had a little team of guys that he was kind of coaching, competing with. Now, at this point, I think Frank had already tried it like five or six times. This may have been like his seventh attempt at Best Ranger. And Air, um, Isaac Kamazel and I were running around the track together. Now, this would have been 95. Sorry, totally off. So I'm running around the track. Frank has got a team of guys that are with them. And we're just running around the track, putting a couple of laps in that day. And I ran by him and I heard after, as I passed him by, Frank said to the rest of the team, if you want to win, you're going to have to be able to outrun guys like that. Me. Um, and I thought to myself, I am certainly not the fastest guy out there. But what Frank was basically saying is there's no way to win this thing without putting in the work, right? Absolutely. It, it, is a, it is about a modicum of work that's necessary just to be prepared for that competition. There's lots of debate about this, Walt. I want to hear your opinion about it. In, in international endurance competitions, adventure racing, kind of the nonstop, once the gun goes off, it's all you until you cross the finish line. This thing usually ranks way up there in the top. And some years it's considered number two or three toughest endurance event in the world, literally not just military, but all endurance events anywhere on the planet. Some years it's ranked number three or four. Um, and I, I think there is something, one or two things that's unique about Best Ranger compared to all of those other events that are conducted, big flashy races that are conducted around the world. And that's the incredibly controlled environment, meaning food and sleep and all of those things are strictly controlled. There's no sleep programmed in the competition. You sleep when it's over with or whenever you can get a moment between events. So you've done some pretty hard things in your life. I mean, anybody who knows your military career knows this guy has uh, excelled at a lot of pretty hard things. Where do you rank best ranger on some of the tough things that you've done in the military? I, you know, I, I think it's, it's up there is the toughest or one of the toughest, you know, I've never really stratified any of them, but yeah, I just, in my mind, I know the ones that are, are, are really hard. The ones that, you know, took a lot of grit, took a lot of commitment. Um, to your point, best ranger is you, you're out there in military issued boots and in the military rucksack and you're wearing load bearing equipment with, with, I mean, and you're carrying a rifle and you, you you can't eat the optimal food. Uh, That's you, right. you There's don't have no Gatorade, uh, you know, uh, station no. waiting for you at mile twenty of this twenty six mile event. No, there, there, one of the many events. There, there's no yeah, there's no real assistance. It's you and your buddy team, and you're thrown in the environments, and you're using just the standard issue equipment to get after it. And, and that kind of, that's one of the, the beautiful things about the competition yeah. is they've, they've boiled it down so that there's no advantage to anybody, any of the competitors. It, it's really their preparation and their technical and tactical proficiency and, and just what they can do together. The, the two best guys on the day. Yeah. Um, so I started becoming a fan of Best Ranger in 1989. By 1991-ish, um, my boss, my uh, direct supervisor was Joe Uliberry. I was a staff sergeant at the time. Joe Uliberry was a sergeant first class. He was out running with our team and we were probably mile 11 into an 18 mile run one day. And Joe Uliberry looked over at me at about four o'clock in the morning on this very long run. And he said, Jeff, you should think about doing Best Ranger. Now for the audience, Joe Uliberry won this thing years before that. And Joe Uliberry was a bit of a legend in my mind and most of the Ranger community, just because anybody who wins this thing becomes, you know, kind of superstar status overnight. And I remember, I'll never forget the conversation. We're out there running. It's he and I and a couple of other folks for this reconnaissance team. And Joe says, Jeff, you should think about doing it. And I said, Joe, I don't, I don't know why you would think I could do Best Ranger. Like, I'm not strong enough. I remember saying, I'm not big enough and I'm not uh, muscular enough to do it. And Joe said, none of the guys that are muscular win it. The person that wins Best Ranger is going to be the guy who, A, has a exceptional level of endurance, and two, is tough enough to handle pain for a long, long time. And Jeff, I'm telling you, I think you have what it takes to do Best Ranger. That's all he said. Just do Best Ranger. 
that's the first moment in my life I ever felt like, wait a second, if a guy who won this thing thinks I may be able to even show up at the starting line, then I would I would think about giving it a try. But even for me, it took me a couple of more years to work up the courage. It actually wasn't until 93 and I was watching two friends of mine, Kurt Buka and Rick Merritt, compete together that I said, you know what? I think I'm going to give it a try next year. And I started working in on earnest the summer of 1993. And I don't think I stopped working for four years straight to prepare my body for what best ranger would take. Um, and if it wasn't for Joe Uluary, I would have never considered it because in my mind, you have to be far bigger, far stronger, far faster, far tougher than I was. Um, and Joe was the guy who said, you really should think about it. Um, I have always said Anybody who's still in the competition at the finishing line is, in my opinion, a winner. Now, there's only one winning team. And for the listeners out there, Best Ranger is conducted in a two-person team every year. You actually have to have a lot of skills and a lot of experience to even start this thing, meaning a Ranger tab. You have to successfully complete the Ranger course. You have to have some airborne training. You have to have a little bit of you know military experience or else you just are not going to be able to make it. But... In my opinion, just being at the finish line, just crossing the finish line makes you success. If, if I was going to define success for Best Ranger, it's certainly not winning, though that's what everybody wants. It's crossing the finish line. Um, you know this better than most, Walt. What makes just crossing the finish line so difficult about this? And I think this is one of those things that separates this competition from all the other adventure races out there. Yeah. Uh, you start in this field of 52 man teams. You know, I, I think when I first started competing, it was usually about 30, 30 teams, you know, in, in the nineties, but nowadays there's 50, there's 50 of these, these, uh, these two person teams, Ranger buddy teams, and, and they are well coached, well prepared. And at least half of that field is, is going for the title. Um, so, you know, they're just, they are just taking it to you on every event. There are so many teams and these are, you know, you're kind of talking about like borderline world-class athletes that have become I soldiers. Totally agree. Yep. Absolutely. Before you even start, most of those team pe pe teammates out there are world-class athlete level before the gun goes off. Absolutely. And, and, and they're prepared, uh, they're tough, they're experienced. And they are so hungry. There is there is an intensity in each event where, you know, I, I think about it like a car that's going in the RPMs up to the red line. Everybody knows you can't you can't run a three day event when you're in the red line. But best ranger is every single event. The pe people are gunning to win that event. And so they're, they are right on the border and you have to be so physically prepared that you can run yourself up to the, the red line border of your RPMs, uh, of your, your human machine on that event and just have the faith that you're going to recover in time before the next event begins. And sometimes you get, you know, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. Sometimes you're right, right from one event to the next back to back. And they'll do that intentionally just to take the starch out of you, particularly on day one. Yeah. Um, talk about the number of people, the number of teams that actually finish this thing. So right now, generally speaking, about 55 teams are invited to start Best Ranger. And just so you know, they come from across the United States Army, but they also come from other services. And in the 90s, when I was doing it, some of those teams came from around the world, literally, literally some Canadian teams or some Navy SEAL teams that were starting this thing. 55, 50 to 60 teams start, but that is not at all close to how many are going to actually cross the finish line. So describe what the attrition looks like every year in Best Ranger. Yeah, and they, they, almost, they almost have a, a formula for how many teams they can support just logistically on day two and then on day three based on the time it takes to conduct each event and how many stations they have to rotate you through. So as you and I know, on day one, you know, 50, 55 teams are going to start, but on that first night, depending on which event they've laid, if it's nine navigation or it's the forced foot march, there's a, you know, as we know it as a floating finish line. And they're basically a tritting teams that can't make, you know, as teams are falling off the back of the pack, 
they know, okay, going into day two, we can logistically support, you know, 25 teams and day three, we can maybe support 20, whatever, whatever they've worked out for the year. But yeah, there's a, there's this floating finish line for an event that's as tough as that foot march or that, you know, really the foot march. And, and they're just, you know, as, as soon as enough teams have just not met that standard being set by whoever the lead lead guys are in the road march that are burning it down up front, you know, they, that that's the cut. So it's almost like you're making a cut. Yeah. Well, thank you for the listener out there that is struggling to figure this out. I want you to imagine the Ironman marathon or the Ironman triathlon in Kona, Hawaii, or I want you to imagine like the Boston marathon, but imagine it as these are without a doubt, the best triathletes, the best uh, marathoners on the planet. And the event is uh, orchestrated in such a way that at the halfway point, not even the halfway point, one third point, two thirds point, we're going to cut half of the more than half of the competitors. And by making it so physically demanding that you just can't get your body across the, 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 the um, you know, the end point or the point uh, in enough time to be able to, to cross this point on the course in enough time. So you're out. Um, which makes the level of intensity on those events, it's, there's no way to describe the insane intensity of those events that everybody knows, okay, this is an eliminator event. And some of us are not going to be around when this thing is off over, which means you have to literally lay it all out there. Um, more than once, I said to Aaron Weaver and to Isaac Gamazel, this is one of those events that if we don't come in towards the front of the event, we will go to the hospital almost on our deathbed because we don't have a choice. It's one of those two options and only one of those two options, um, which makes this thing, the, the intensity level of those events is really hard to demonstrate, even if you're very familiar with ultra endurance or adventure racing. You know, the, the way you laid that out is really that kind of uh, helps bolster, you know, the, the answer to the question, what makes it so tough? And it's, yeah, you, you, it, you get in these, these do or die events where it, no matter how you feel, you've still got to just lay it all out there. And, and to your point, it's like you, you're up against a, a pack of, of uh, you know, like sled dogs that will pull, yeah. they'll pull that sled till their death and, and you're running neck and neck with them. And that's kind of, that's, you know, it's kind of amped up to that level. They're that committed. It really is. Um, for anyone who's familiar with the best ranger competition, they know your name and they know your name because you've competed a lot, but Walt, um, anyone who finishes best ranger is a success. In my opinion, anybody who wins best ranger becomes a superstar. Um, and that's just because of the way the military views this competition. But if my math is correctly, there are only three human beings on the planet that have ever tried this thing and won it more than once. I certainly wasn't willing to try to win after winning in 1996. When everybody asked me, Jeff, are you going to do it again in 97? My answer was absolutely not under no conditions. Are you crazy? I'm not even sure why I won in 96. I know I can't pull this one off twice. And Walt, you're one of those few human beings on the planet who has won this thing more than once. I don't even think I know this number, but how many times total have you competed? Uh, so I've competed eight times. Holy smokes. You broke Frank Paul's record because I think Frank's record was seven times. So you may have the record for the most times competing in the competition. Uh, yeah. and I, I don't know what that says about my... Uh... <laughs> I, I may be too much of a glutton for punishment for my own good. Yeah. Well, um, you won in 2007 with Liam Collins. Then you come back around and do it again a couple of times. Win in 2011 with Eric Turk. And I want to get into the weeds on what those two competitions were like, how they were different for each other. But what I really want the listener to know is just how much of a difference a partner makes at one point in the competition and you make for your partner at a different point in the competition, um, because there's no way to over exaggerate the level of dependency these two people are going to have on each other. Every, everyone gets to a moment where I don't know if I have what it takes to finish this event. And then your partner steps up and your partner has a moment where I don't know if I have what it takes. And I'll never forget the image in my mind, 1994, when Mark Nygaard, who was like my third or fourth guest ever on this pot platform, on this podcast, 
Mark Nygaard literally carried his partner across the finish line for the buddy run. And had it not been for his partner physically um, wearing out, like literally could not take another step, Mark Nygaard would have won that year. He had to pick his partner up and carry him across the finish line. And I was competing with him. And I said, Mark, Mark finished third. We finished fourth that year. And I said, Mark, you know that if your partner had a little bit more in the tank, you would have won, you should have won, you deserve to win. And the only reason you didn't win is because your partner just couldn't keep up with you. And he's like, Jeff, that's how the competition goes. It's a two man event. Yep. And I said, yeah, it sure is, man. Yes, absolutely. Um, so back to the competition, we're airing this episode on Thursday night and tomorrow morning, the best ranger competition officially starts. I want people to feel what it feels like to be an insider, to kind of know the pain mm -hmm. and the thrills of Best Ranger. So let's just take this thing day by day. We're not going to go event by event because it's ev it's always different every year. Yeah. But let's take this thing day by day. And I'd like for you, since you've done this now eight times, mm -hmm. to talk about what this feels like at about 4.30 or 5 o'clock on Friday morning when you're assembling on the parade field. Mm -hmm. hour hour and a half before the gun goes off and all of the anxiety and you know all of the anticipation and all of the you know butterflies in the stomach right before the gun goes off which is going to happen for a lot of people tomorrow morning before you start talking um, i'll say this uh one more time in this episode but if you have no idea what this is if you've never experienced or even heard about the best ranger competition I'm going to ask you tomorrow and this weekend to tune in and tune in live at bestrangercompetition.com and you'll be able to watch and kind of hear how the events are going and what's happening with the teams. But Walt, I want you to just kind of narrate for people. This is what it was like behind the scenes. So Friday morning, everybody assembles at Malvesti Field and we're getting ready to, you know, toe the line and the gun to go off. What's going through your mind 45 minutes, you know, 30 minutes before this thing kicks off? Yeah, uh, I, I think I've got a couple different perspectives and they're both similar. You know, I, I'm going to I'm going to try to think about this from like my first competition. Uh, first competition, you've you've put in this work over the course of the last, you know, some people years where they've been building, just trying to build up the base. That build they, the base. Yeah. Uh, and then other people, you know, putting that fine edge. On, on that base that they have so that they're ready for game day, probably for the last, you know, three to four months before, before that morning. Uh, so you're, you're thinking to yourself in your mind, have I put in enough work? You know, was it the right, was it the right kind of mileage, the right variety? Uh, am I prepared in every way that I need to, you know, my swimming, my ranger stake skills, my shooting, uh, my running, my rucking, et cetera. And then, you know, and have I trained my body? Have I, have I trained by eating MREs or was I training with the optimal food instead of right. the, the yep. going to put in the tank? You know, was I always just learning to hydrate with water and the salt packets and maybe the lemon lime and making my own little homemade Gatorade out of the MRE package? You know, have, have I done everything I could to prepare myself? And that's your, that's running through your mind. And then you just have to, you've got to push that aside and say, Trust, trust what I've done, trust the work, trust what my coach has said to do. And, and we've done the work. Now it's time to just breathe, focus and, and start executing. And, and you're going to want to be pulled into looking around at the other competitors. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. You're going to want to size them up. You're going to see, you know, Struker and Gamazel or Struker and Weaver or, you know, whoever it is. And, and you're going to know the name and you're going to think to yourself, OK, those are guys to watch. Those will be pace setters. You know, this Nygaard, he's been here before. We know he can win it this time. So you you know who these who these uh these these players are in the competition that are going to be setting the pace. And you start to tell yourself, okay, if I can stay in the shadow of those two, or if I can start to to edge them out on some events, I am gonna be in the right place. And and so you're you know now now you're building a strategy. I would say the other thing too. My first competition, I was in E four. I'd been in the army for two years. Uh, I had just enough experience to be there. I had I had enough. I just had just enough physical ability and experience to be there to finish, not to win. And 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 you're and you're saying to yourself like, 
well, what if there's a chance? What if, what if it all pans out? What if I find yeah. myself in the right position? And, so and you're so, saying there's a chance. You're saying there's a chance. And so there's there's just, you know, there's there's a plethora of things that are running through your minds. And, and I kind of come back to you've got to breathe, you've got to focus, and you've got to say, hey, what's important right now? Yeah. Did I wake up this morning and hydrate to the best of my ability? Did right. I get enough food in my belly so I'm not going to be too full, but I've got enough energy for the first event? Am I stretching? Or are you getting are you getting caught up in the whirlwind of things in your yeah. mind? And, and so there's just all that there's that anticipation of the things that are, are running through your mind and you can control. And then there's the knowledge that you are getting ready to to spend sixty hours on the pain train. Uh, sixty hours on your feet nonstop, and it is going to be miserable the entire time. Yeah. Yes, and and that's where you start to say to yourself. Like, why am I, you know, like what's on the, <laughs> what, why did I sign up for this? And why, why am I signing up for this? Or in, in some cases, years down the road, it was like, I would have to tell myself, Hey, you've been here before, you know what it feels like on day two yeah. and day three, you know what it feels like when it's done. And, you know, you just think about the reward of, of what you've accomplished together and what you've done for the Ranger community. But on that first competition, you're just like, Hey man, I, I hope I can survive this and I hope I can bear the pain. And I hope I don't let my partner down and my organization down. I think that's the best description I've ever heard of what's going through your mind. Um, there is this week leading up to the start of the Best Ranger competition where all of the teams are kind of in each other's space. And just this is human nature, right? You start to size each other up and everybody's trying to figure out like who are the front runners, but everybody else is also looking at, do I have what it takes to beat him? Is this guy stronger than me? And then sure enough, there's going to be those four or five guys out there that are just physical specimens. And when the doctors are poking and prodding you, they take off their shirt and I sit there and say, oh my God, I don't want to take off my shirt next to this guy because I don't look like he does when I take my shirt off. In fact, the doctors used to laugh at me. They're like, hey, stop messing around, man. We really need to see how far you can stretch. We really need to see how high you can jump vertically. And I'm like, I'm not messing with you. That's all I got. <laughs> I, I can't do anymore. But the guy next to me has a bigger vertical leap than an NBA player. Yeah. And the guy on the other side of me literally looks like he could be on the cover of a, you know, a fitness magazine. And, and I just feel like I am outclassed here. But like you... I don't know what's going to happen when that gun goes off, but I do know this. I'm going to give it everything that I got. And if I'm good enough, I'll still be standing at the finish line. And if I'm not, I'm not. Um, the one thing, kind of, one thing they couldn't measure in that room is, is, is the heart. Cause there's yeah, a, lot the heart, is, right? a lot of heart and a lot of grit. Yeah. I also want to say to the listener, it is humanly impossible and I'm not exaggerating. There is no human way possible that you can be totally prepared for best ranger. And the competition is built like this. The amount of technical stuff, the amount of shooting, the amount of running, the amount of swimming, the amount, the amount of jumping and climbing and obstacle courses. If you spent every waking moment of your day for an entire year, you couldn't master it all. And so nobody's at the start line knowing I've mastered it all. Like Walt is saying, you're just hoping I put the right time in on the right events when I needed to. And I gave other events as much time as I could, but I, I, there's literally not enough time in the day to, to master it all. So I hope I've got what I need, what I need to cross the finish line, but no human being could possibly master them all or be, be ready to master them all before the gun goes off. So every year is different um, for the listener out there that has no familiarity with Best Ranger. There are some constants in the competition that'll generally, there will be these events and usually they will happen sometime around the middle of the second, third day, first day, but everything else is different and it's different every year. And in 1996, when you and I competed, the very first thing that we did is got on helicopters and flew to the mountains of North Georgia, which has never, ever happened before. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm in trouble. One of the very first events up there, they were like, here's what you're going to do next. And I looked at Isaac and said, I've never even heard of this before, let alone know how to do what we're supposed to do. And we're about to be timed and graded on this. And Isaac said, don't worry about it, man. I've done this before. We're good. I'll show you what to do. Yeah. Um, all right. Ready? Go. Um, yeah. So. Can you kind of describe the dealing with the unknown of Best Ranger? Because there are some knowns, but there's a ton of unknowns in this thing. Yeah. Uh, 
thanks for framing that out. That that it really is what they do with that competition. There's no way you can know everything that's going to come down the pipe, and they like to put some things in there that hopefully nobody has done before. So. Yeah, they're hoping that either you have some life experience in this event, like the Texas Prusik on day one of Dahlonega in 1990s. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, here's how I've learned to approach those events. It's communication with your partner. You take a yeah. look, you listen carefully, Definitely. you pay attention to the task, the conditions and the standards. And then once you've taken in all the information and you know the envelope that you can work in, so that you know, you know, you're you're not trying to sh- you're not trying to um, you know short stroke the task in any way, shape, or form. But okay, this is what we're being asked to do, and you step back, and then you come together, and you've got to communicate with your partner, and you've got to talk about a plan. Like like Isaac stepped up and said, "Hey Jeff, don't worry about this. I've done this." And then you know, it, or if neither of the two of you have a lot of experience in it, you got to go back to what you know, pull out the tools that you have. Talk about a plan. Talk about how you should sequence what the two of you are doing if you have to do it together or if you're both doing the same skill and being graded individually on it. But just have a plan. Go with what you know, you know, and then talk, talk it through, rehearse it, and then try to execute that strategy that you just developed. And a lot of this is what makes, think, this, makes this a thinking individual's game. Yeah, it sure with, is. The ability to pull something together on your feet that's coherent in the last few minutes and then execute that. There are people that are driving right now, listening to this in the van, minivan with their children. There's guys sitting at home watching this thing on YouTube. And most of them are probably thinking, I don't understand. I'm never going to do Best Ranger. Why are, why are Jeff and Walt even going into this kind of detail? And the truth is, there is a lot of life experiences that best ranger will help you through if you just listen to what walt is saying there is something that's going to happen to you tomorrow you've never expected it you're not prepared for it and you can either totally freak out and lose control and stress and and turn in a poor performance or you can do what walt's saying all right i've never done this before i don't even know what i'm supposed to do next and it's essential to finish this thing but i'm gonna take a step back get myself under control, take a breath, and I'm going to use the tools I have. And if it's good enough, it's good enough. And if it's not good enough, it's good. And it's not good enough. And I personally believe this is just Jeff's opinion, Walt, that there is a lot of tools for life that you carry into the best ranger competition and a lot of the best ranger competition that anybody can learn from. And some of those facing the unknowns, best ranger has mastered this and some guys, frankly, don't face the unknown very well. They can knock out the known events really well, but the unknown is so unnerving for them that they just fall apart on them. Um, okay, so you're now, let's say, several hours into the first day. You're already physically exhausted. It's only noon on the first day, and we're six hours into a 60-hour event, and you're starting to think to yourself, what on earth did I just do to myself? Because I'm not even, uh, you know, half, I'm not even a quarter of the way through this thing. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it through the first day, let alone the whole competition. There are a couple of times where you get a little physical break. So can you talk about maybe some of the shooting on the first day, some of the ranger, what's called ranger stakes events on the second day that provide a very brief a physical break, but frankly, the technical and the military skills necessary, it's no joke. And if you can't do that stuff, you're out anyway. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so some of those, some of those, either the shooting or the technical skills, I mean, I've seen such a broad variety of stuff that they, that they weave into the competition. Sometimes it's as simple as a stationary pop-up target range, like you would qualify on a basic training, uh, um, other times it's, you know, a moving target range or you're you're shooting a pistol and a rifle and a shotgun and a long range precision weapon system like a sniper rifle. And you're doing it all for time. Um, they'll, they'll take these these tasks that in isolation by themselves would be relatively easy. 
but they'll be difficult due to your fatigue generally. Uh, they've already they've already fatigued you, uh, they, or they'll elevate your heart rate. And so something that's normally a pretty easy, simple task, straightforward, can become difficult either just because you know uh, you're breathing hard and your heart rate is up, or you're tired and you're fatigued and you're having a hard time concentrating. Uh, maybe you haven't been keeping your blood sugar up. You know, so like that's just kind of the shooting stuff. That so the shooting is is a is a broad variety, and they'll 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 have you employ a mortar weapon system. They'll have you machine gun, you know, pistol rifle, shotgun. They'll they'll vary it to to you know because you can be an expert in one field, but kind of going back to how do you do across yeah. a variety of things consistently, and it's about it's about top consistent performance by two people. Yeah. And then the the skill stuff is um, it's really awesome because if you look at any professional sport, professional athletes take the basics and they refine it and they do it thousands of times and 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 they take the basics and they they weave a bunch of basics together to make them look like they're doing something very complex, which it is at at a level of precision, speed, strength, whatever the sport requires, and. And in Best Ranger, they're going to take you back down to those basics and they're going to put you in, you know, a fatigued and one of your worst conditions that you want to face those things in. And can you still remember how to do the calculations to, to build a demo charge to to cut down a tree to set up an ambush? Can you can you do uh, can you plot your grid coordinates correctly on the map? And if you can't, well, you, you're going to end up punishing yourself because you're going you're going to an area on the ground where there's nobody waiting for you. Uh, can you tie the knots uh, as fast as possible to the standard? Um, and, and it's it's really that's the beauty of it. It's like it's still focusing on the fundamentals. And for people to be world class athletes, or, or not world class athletes, but to be world class soldiers, you know, come back and do all of these fundamentals well. And hey, we'll, yeah. we're going to throw we're going to throw sixteen of these fundamentals at you uh, over the course of a, a late night after a road march, and then the next day. Right. And, and we'll see how you do with that. Yeah, I'm glad you're saying that, Walt, because some guys are sitting there listening and saying, it doesn't sound that hard. You take apart four or five weapon systems, you mix all of the pieces together in a big ball, you cover it up with a tarp, and then you just tell people, okay, time, go ahead, un uh, uncover the weapons and start to pull these pieces together and put these four or five weapons together. Most people are sitting there saying, oh, no big deal. I could do that. Well, the guys that are doing it are putting four or five weapons together in about three minutes. And not only are they doing it in three minutes, but they're doing it at three o'clock in the morning, 23 hours with no sleep. And they've already got 30 miles on their feet. And your fingers, I'll never forget this, are so swelled up because of all of the walking that you've done that they're literally not working like they're supposed to. Like, I don't know if I can even write my name. And now I've got to push this little pin into the receiver on a, on a rifle. And I can't even make my fingers work. And when you just look at it from a distance, it, it looks like, okay, that's hard. But when you're actually doing it, you're like, wait a second. I don't think you understand just how hard this is when you factor in the sleep deprivation and the amount of miles that you already have on you um, just to pull off some of those events. I'll never forget some of those night events where, hey, we want you to calculate radio wave propagation. We want you to build your own antenna and you have to do it all by time. And by the way, you have to figure this out on a piece of paper and a pen. Well, I joined the army because I don't like math in the first place and I haven't slept in the last 23 hours. I don't even know if I could do basic math right now. Yeah. And it's time to go. Um, so uh, some of those night events, those technical events on the first night are brutal and it's not the physical event, it's how mentally challenging they are when you're already thoroughly exhausted. Yeah, that's that's so true. You know, whether you were a rock climber or a CrossFit athlete or a carpenter, you know, I'm trying to find some analogy there, but, but to your point, something that if, you know, the, the best in the world are going to do that very fast, very accurately, and they're going to make it look easy. And that's where, a, as a spectator, you're like, oh, that didn't seem that bad. But, you know, you you go and attempt to climb that that 510, that 511 route or or build a roll top desk or, yeah. you know, do a CrossFit open workout. And you see what the best people in the world are doing it in. And you're just like, oh, my gosh, like, uh, uh, you know, like I, I'm a I'm a, an eighth of the way towards what that and just put out and, and it 
it kind of reinforces for you, you know, the, the commitment that it takes and that just to kind of weave that into like, th that was the commitment that everybody was putting into the Ranger stakes. And, and really what's at stake for the competitors is, Hey, if I have one bad event, all of this, all of this work I'm putting uh -huh. in these three days yeah. and all of the months and years of preparation, I just fumbled the ball. It's gone. You know, yeah, like like yeah. there was the Super Bowl. I just fumbled the ball, you know, and and I can't make it back. That's the perfect analogy. Some of those technical events are really like I am in the deep in the fourth quarter. I've got the football. I am heading towards the end zone. And if I drop the ball right now, I lose the Super Bowl. And what's at stake is my entire season of work and yeah. you know training that left up to this. It's not just dropping the ball at this moment in the game. It's the entire year or multiple years of planning and training that's gone up to it. And for a lot of people, it's the technical events that will tear them up. I've always said, you cannot win. You can finish, but you cannot win if you can't master those technical events. And then there's always two or three events in there that nobody's ever even heard of before, right? Like, okay, now you're going to go throw a hatchet at a, you know, a target halfway across an open field. And this is timed and it's a, you know, a graded exercise. So knock yourself out, get ready, go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's get into the, in my opinion, the heart of best ranger is the second night and what I don't, I don't. I don't know that this is the right language, but what separates the men from the boys or there hasn't been women yet, but the day that women start competing in best ranger, the grown women from the little girls is the second night because there's a moment that a few teams realize we can win if we don't kill ourselves, literally kill ourselves trying to cross the finish line. And I really believe most of the rest of the people that are still in it about the second night realize I think I can cross the finish line, but there's no way I can win. So Walt, you've been there more than a few times. Can you describe what the second night is like when people start to realize I might be in the running to win this thing, but I also might literally kill myself trying to make it across the finish line in first place. Thinking back to my first competition, you know, seeing you, seeing Isaac Gamazo, seeing the guys that were in the hunt and and just seeing the intensity and the focus on those, on that group of competitors that are all, they're all in the podium hunt and, and they're all, so there's a chance that they're going to win. And so they're going to lay, to your point, they're going to lay it all on the line. They, that second night is set up so that you've got 50 pounds on your back again. You're carrying a rifle again. Most of the time it's land navigation. Sometimes they flip flop it and, and it's the foot march. Um, and I actually feel like the foot march on night two is, is worse. It's more worse, de definitely worse. Heck yeah. Because you're going to go out and you're going to put in a marathon's worth of distance with this weight on your back. And to your point, like you've already said, you're tired you are, you've already done a marathon with 50 pounds of weight on your back. You've already done a bunch of, you know, 5k sprint and swim and obstacle courses and, and other events to, to really wear you out. And, and this is where it comes into like, okay, has the work been put in? Okay. The work has been put in. I got to trust my body, my partner and I, we can do another marathon tonight, but Hey, we're not just doing a marathon. We're doing it for time. We're doing it for accuracy. We have to yeah. plot. We have to plot these points accurately. We cannot screw around with our navigation. We can't drone in the middle of the night because 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 you're you know it be you know a marathon is is done in you know two to three hours for world class people. But this is another like twelve this in, is in, twelve this, hours of oh, nonstop brutal. Another 12 hours on your feet knowing like, okay, can I, you know, I'm going to go up and down these hills, cross country through swamps, trails, roads at night in the dark and map and compass. And it's me and my partner. We've got to get after it. And you have to just mentally keep your head in the game that whole time. And you start to come into time, speed, distance calculations where you're like, okay, can we get this last point? You know, we've gotten almost all the points they've laid out or sometimes they, 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 they give you like a, they call it a Rogaine style where they, they give the points that are the hardest to get to the furthest away, the most point value. And so you're thinking on the fly, you're looking at how much time you have left. If you don't make it to the finish line in time, guess what? Thanks for participating for two and a half days. You're out. You're out. Here's your T-shirt, um, you know, and we'll see you at the Super Supper on the sidelines. 
Man, did Isaac ever tell you what I did to him on the second night? I knew you and Isaac talked a little bit before and after the competition. Did he tell you what I did to him on the second night? Probably because I picked his brain about everything that you guys did. And you guys became, okay. you guys were my blueprint from that point forward. One of my biggest best ranger mistakes ever was 1996. Now I have been covering the, the land that we will be walking on literally at this point for, I think six or seven years, I knew it better than I knew my backyard. Mm -hmm. And like you said, they laid out all the points. If you want to get to all of them, you're going to cover 30 or 35 miles. The guys that are going to get the minimum are going to cover 25 miles tonight. But if you only cover 25 miles, you can't possibly win. If you think you're going to win, you're going to have to cover 30 or 35 miles. So I lay out the points. I figure out a route. We start walking. And when you check into a point for the listeners, they kind of show, if you look down at the, the clipboard, you can kind of see who's been here before me and who am I in front of. And if you know a little bit about where you're at in the stacking of comp, uh, the teams, you might know, hey, I'm, I'm, we're doing okay. We might be able to beat the team that's in front of us. Well, first, second, third, fourth, fifth point, we come in first or second on every one of them. And I get us to a point going from number five to six that I'm like, hey, we need to go left and go down this trail. And long story short, I, I, I went the wrong direction for 45 minutes, 45 oh. minutes down this trail. I said, oh man, we made a mistake. Not only do we make a mistake, but we made a 45 minute mistake, which means now it's an hour and a half to correct this mistake. Isaac, we've got to go back the opposite direction and yeah. farther than what we've gone. Let's yes. go. We get to the next point, And now I, we are no longer in first place going on these, uh, to these points. We're now in seventh place. Mm. And I made it, this is at t six hours in to this 12 hour land navigation event. I looked at Isaac and said, Isaac, I have done this to you. It is a hundred percent my fault, man. I'm sorry, but here's the truth. If you and I don't start running right now with the heavy load on our back, and if we don't start running, we can't get to, we physically cannot get to all of the points tonight. And if we yep. don't get to all of them, we can't win. And I Let's remember hope. at six hours in, I looked at him and said, can you run? And here's what I asked him. Can you run with that heavy load on your back for the next six hours without stopping? And to his credit, Isaac said, Jeff, I don't know if I can do that, man. Like physically, yeah. I don't know if I'll die before I get there. And I said, Isaac, I don't know if I can either, but if yeah. you and I don't start running now, we mm -hmm. will not finish. Yeah. The event starts at 8 p.m. It ends at 8 a.m. And at about 7.57, Isaac and I came in. And I remember the guy who runs the competition is saying, how many did you get? And I was like, we got them all, but we almost didn't make it to the finish line. And to your point, Walt, if you don't cross the finish line, here's your T-shirt. See you later. Thanks for trying. And that is to this day, the most physically grueling thing that I've ever, honestly, I, we put in a hundred miles that year and 30 of those 100 miles were my mistake. Um, well, probably 20 of those hundred miles were my mistake and it's a hundred percent my fault, but the competition is designed in such a way that, okay, you just made a 45 minute mistake. Now you're going to run for the next six hours to correct this mistake because there's no margin for error. And I want to take a moment now for you to talk about Liam Collins and Aaron Tur and Eric Turk, because one of the first years that I competed, I was running a marathon just as a training event. I was like, I'm going to go down to Pensacola, Florida. I'm going to run the Blue, Mar Blue Angels marathon. And I, I turned in my fastest maritime, marathon time ever. I'm not going to tell everybody what it was. And at about mile 15, Liam Collins passes me and he's at about mile 21, which means at the start, he has got a six miles uh, advantage on me, 15 miles into a marathon. And when he was done, Liam, who ran his first marathon ever that year, qualified for the U.S. Olympic team. I was like, Liam, do you realize that your marathon time makes you a qualifier for trying out for the U.S. Olympic marathon team? Yeah. He's like, oh, man, it was just a training event for me. I've <laughs> never seen a human being on the planet that can run like Liam Collins. How yeah. on earth did you keep up with that guy in 2007, man? So I had competed against him twice before we partnered up. And um, to your point, like I saw what this guy was capable of. I mean, just a, I mean, when you say world class, like literally world class, it, when you when you qualify he is a freak of nature, he yes. really is. 
the Olympic trial, when you get an invitation to the Olympic trials, you know, you're in a whole nother category on, uh, on your first ever marathon and really had never run a marathon distance in your life. Yes. And, and here's what I loved about Liam, the way he characterized himself. He walked softly, but man, could he deliver. And, you know, he, he's like, oh, I love coming in with these army glasses on and looking like this little, <laughs> this, little, this little scrawny guy that, you know, would never make the cover of a fitness magazine. He's like, and then on day one, he's like, I take him off and I'm like, Clark Kent, like, please try to yes, keep up. He really me. is. Clark yes. Kent going to Superman. But cho choosing to partner with Liam was a deliberate decision. I had I had had a lot of really good partners, very talented. I even partnered with a guy who had who had won before, and um, and, and you know I just was never able to win it. And so, uh, 2007 was that was my fifth competition, and we said, hey, let's get together and do this. And the fact that he was looking at me with the mutual respect, where he thought yeah, I could keep right. up with him, badge of honor for me. So. Winning the competition for me was always finding somebody that I was just holding on by my fingertips to, to stay, to keep up with them. And then I would deliver on the rest of everything else because I knew that, that Eric Turks and the Liam Collins of the world are going to be the fastest people in oh, the yeah. field. Like, yeah. and, like, and you're just like, imagine, you know, like a, a, you know, an imaginary snap link, you're snapped yeah. in and you're holding on right. for your life. And, and that's really, that's really how it was for me. We in 2007, we did a three mile run in body armor. And when we were at like mile two, I looked at my watch and I told Liam, I said, Hey, Liam, we're running sub six minute miles. With oh, my word. With 20 pounds of body armor on, you know, and we've got to do an obstacle course when we get to the end of this three mile run. I was like, You're going to have to back it down for me to like a six minute and 30 right. second mile just so I can quasi recover. But yeah, those guys are they're on they're on another level, and and uh, and believe it or not, there are points in the competition where you're carrying one another. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I can remember on night two for Liam and I, where where like I, I took the radio that night. I took more weight uh, yeah. because it was more about longer distance and accuracy with navigation, and that was more my forte, where I could bear more weight for a longer period of time. But he just had the all out speed. Um, over distance. Aaron Weaver was my partner in 94 and 95. We came in fourth place both of those years. Without a doubt, Aaron Weaver is one of the fastest people I have ever seen in my life. I can't keep up with him in medium and short distances. And Aaron and I ran one year against Liam and Best Ranger. We were doing the two mile run. Aaron came in second. I came in third. I turned in my second fastest two mile run in my life. I think it was like a 920. And Liam had crossed the finish line a minute and a half before me, like in, in eight minutes flat or something. And I was like, there's, there's no human being on the planet that could keep up with Liam. I couldn't keep up with Aaron in the short distance, but there were longer distances where Aaron would look at me and say, Jeff, I can't keep going at this rate with this load. And so I'd grab Aaron's weapon and I take mine and his Aaron swing your arms. If you can keep up, I'll carry both the weapons and, and we'll keep going or um, I did this to Isaac, like, Isaac, I can't keep up with your pace because you've got tree trunks for, for legs. If I can take a little bit of my weight and put it on your shoulders, I can hang with you, but I can't keep my load and, and keep your pace at the same time. And Best Ranger is built like that so that when I'm weak, you're strong. And when you're strong, I'm weak. Uh, or when, when I'm strong, you're weak. W the kiss of death is when I'm weak and you're weak at the same time. It's great yeah. if we're both strong at the same time, but if you and I are both weak at the same time, we're in trouble. Yeah. Um, you also won with Eric Turk in 2011. And if I remember correctly, Turk had already won by then. You had already won by then. So now you guys are partnering up, two former winners mm -hmm. partnering up together. And we've already talked about the pressure, but it's hard to exaggerate once you've won this thing now literally everybody is gunning for you and they're going to keep gunning for you because you're the one known quality out there that if i can take walt down then maybe i can win this thing so you want to talk about 2011 with turk and and the pressure of being back out there as a former winner with another former winner and everybody gunning for you too yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay this at all, but when I think back on that competition and I think about doing it with Eric, um, well, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of peace in knowing like, okay, I've won this. I've, I finally won this thing one time. 
I, I'm at peace with this uh, endeavor that I set out to to accomplish. Um, competing with Eric was like um, I, I didn't feel the pressure. I honestly was able to block that out where I would where I was at peace with the fact that hey we're going to go out there and and we are going to give it our best and and we are going to do the competition proud and our organizations proud in the ranger community and and we're going to give you everything we have because that's just the unspoken commitment coming into this and if it pans out that we're raising the pistols at the end like it'll be mission accomplished and it'll be fantastic but going through the competition with him was was almost like being in an event with somebody I'd done it with before, even though we yeah. didn't even get a chance to, to partner up together because we were on different deployed cycles and he was coming back from a deployment. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. So he, he had been out of the loop and he was coming back, but I just knew like this guy lives at a base where he's always prepared yeah. for best ranger. Yeah. And so, you know, we said, Hey, let, you know, let's get together and let's just do it. Let's just give this a shot, you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, we can be the guys that were able to win it the second time after after Paul Skirka. And um, there was there was a piece in, in every event that we were executing because he was strong. I was strong. We had we'd been there mentally so many other times that it was like, this is the pace we need to keep. Let's stay right behind the leaders on this. Let's put let's let's make everybody follow us on that event. You know, let's put out here. Let's put out there. We were executing our Ranger stakes. I mean, it just it just. Sometimes it falls into your lap and yeah, we were, sometimes stuff goes your way. Yeah. We were, we were executing with precision and I was like, Hey, we are building so much momentum in this that like, okay, we're, we, the wave has caught us and now we just have to continue to execute well. And, and, and this is going to pan out and it felt great. Um, and, and that's not to downplay it at all because all of those things still exist. You know, there's still the nerves and there's, there's still the hope you've prepared and there's still the teams that are gunning for you. They're gunning for you and they're making it painful for you every single event. Like, okay, we can't just coast in the first place on the road march. No, there's a team that, that wants us <laughs> to choose. Right. Yeah. Like, where did they come from? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the, uh, the competition is built in such a way that you can never really coast. It doesn't matter if you're the most experienced. It doesn't matter if you've done it eight times. There's no way that you can coast. And the pressure that's on a team to just be able to stay in the competition tomorrow because I might get cut if I don't if I'm not part of the, you know, the top of the pack on this next eliminator event um, makes it impossible to coast. But when it's over with, anybody who tries this thing, in my opinion, deserves a lot of respect. The guys who finish it, and I've said this for years, I'm at the finish line, and the team that comes in last place but still finished, I will shake their hands and say, man, I'm super proud of you. You ought to go home feeling really good about yourself because you succeeded and finished Best Ranger, where most people will never try it, and more than half to try it won't even finish. Yeah, but I want I want to make sure the audience understands the military, the U.S. military. This is world level. You really are an Olympic level athlete in the best ranger competition, but you don't get the sponsorship. You don't get, uh, you know, the accolades. You don't get uh, television commercials and you're not making tons of money. In fact, the, the not, Department of Defense prohibits you from being able to win lots of money as a result of this. So when it's all said and done, there's not a there's not a there's not money in your bank account or a whole lot, uh, you know, that you gain personally from this. Yeah, you you achieve superstar status if you win it. And if you're one of the three freaks of nature who've done it, who've won it more than once, you become, you know, one of those names that will will be etched in in people's memory forever. But what makes Best Ranger, uh, you know, what continues to bring out the best competitors on the first day is what this thing represents for the whole military. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about what about the pride and the respect that you're bringing to your unit? Because if it's not for that, I don't know why anybody really does it, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Why would anybody put themselves through that kind of pain if it's just for your name to be engraved on a plaque that's in a building somewhere? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm so glad that you want to talk about this aspect of it, Jeff, because, you know, when I think back to the first time as a young specialist E4 uh, in 
going to do the competition, there's a little bit of like, hey, this will this will bolster my blue chips and kind of give me the street cred with my platoon and my company and all that other stuff, uh, which you want to do for all the right reasons, because you want to be a reliable, competent member of that team um, and, and, and the challenge. You know, you're in that for the challenge. But you start to realize, to your point, that like what everybody is putting out in there is the epitome of selfless service. The the pain and the intensity of the events and and how how gritty the competition is um, is a reflection of selfless service, commitment, and sacrifice. And you start to realize when you're in the competition, people don't people don't they're not they're not saying oh there's um there's Walt and Liam or, or you know there's Walt and and uh, and and uh, you know John Smith or something from you know back, going back then. It's like oh that's the regiment or those are army talking people. about your unit. They're talking about your organization. They're, they're taking it to another level where it's the Ranger community or the U.S. Army or Department of Defense or service members. And you quickly start to realize like, oh, my goodness, I'm a part of something so much bigger than myself. And what we're displaying out here is the spirit of the American yeah. service member yeah. and, and everything that goes into raising your right hand and swearing to uphold and defend this constitution. And it becomes so much bigger. And and I'll tell you too, like that, had, that really became the juice for me in my late years of competing. Um, it, it is phenomenal. It is just a phenomenal experience to, to showcase that to the people that, that are there to cheer you on and, and know that you are going to live this creed when the nation calls on you yeah. to do what needs to be done right. for them. Walt, I got called into the Ranger Regimental Commander's office at the time. It was Bill Lazinski, Colonel Lazinski in 1996. Yeah. And he said, Jeff, I am asking you as a personal favor to compete this year because I don't think we can win as a unit if you're not competing. And mm -hmm. I said, sir, I don't think I can. I mean, I've just got too many other things going. And he said, I'm asking you, would you do this? Not for me. Would you do this for the Ranger Regiment? And when he asked that question, I went home, I prayed about it. I talked to my wife about it the next day. I said, yeah, for you, I'm not for you, not for me, but I'll do it for the Ranger Regiment. And I don't know if you remember this, Walt, but you and your partner were really, really strong in 96. And there was a moment in the competition where I thought there's one or two teams from the Ranger Regiment that might be able to win this thing. Can we all agree, kind of the guys from the Ranger Regiment together, we will do whatever it takes for one of us to win this thing. Like if we have to sacrifice, if we have to get in between number one and number three, whatever we've got to do, we will make the sacrifice so that our unit is gets the credit. Not me personally, not my team, but our unit gets the credit. And I don't know any other world-class athlete that would be willing to make that sacrifice. Most of them, they want the golden medal around their neck. They want their name in lore. And for you and I, it was all about the unit, 100% about the unit. In fact, when it was over with, I may have told you this, I took the pistol back and put it on the commander's desk and said, never been a, a, a round fired through it. It's yours. I didn't do it for me. I didn't do it for myself. I did it for the unit. Put yeah. it on display somewhere so the unit knows this was all for them. Yeah. Um, and that's very different about this world-class number two, number three, toughest endurance competition in the world is the motivation for showing up and starting this thing in the first place. Yeah. You, you know what you just laid out there. So I learned that from you in 96. I, I, I had no, I didn't understand the strategy. I didn't understand that like, oh, my, my duty now on day three, I, I can't win. You know, I make it, I make it a good finish, a, 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 but you know, you know that I could be fast on this particular event. Hey, we have a strategy now to bolster the rest of our teammates. I, I didn't, I didn't even realize that that sort of uh, thing existed in the competition. And so I learned that from you. I remember carrying that down the road in other competitions I remember going out in the buddy run one year when, um, you know, my partner and I were super strong, but for reasons we, you know, we weren't going to win that year, but we wanted to take another team from third to second. And, and, and so what did, we, what did we do? We punished ourselves to, to push the pace so that the guys that were, you know, neck and neck for second and third, were going to have to then put out. And uh -huh. we did it, we did it to get in between, you know, we went out there and we pushed the pace and then we stopped just short of the finish line and let our buddies cross. I love back. it. I and love then, it. 
counted the number of teams that had to go in between us. And to, then you come across the finish and then, line. And then we walked across. Beautiful. People looked at us like we're crazy. They're like, what are you doing? And I was like, there's a plan it's called here. strategy. Yeah. Or we called it strategy. It's just yeah. a little strategy. Yeah. But 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 I love how it, it, it is. It really becomes more about yourself. It's something that you get to do as an individual um, and as a team. But it's it really in the end, it is it, it's about so much more than those individuals. I've, I feel like a kid in a candy store every year when this thing starts. Tomorrow morning, I always feel like what an honor to be able to see these guys and one day, hopefully soon, gals yeah, giving be it everything that they've got because of what they represent, what they stand for. Um, and I really do consider myself the world's biggest fan of the Best Ranger competition, which makes me a Walt Zakowski fan, one of Walt's biggest fans. In your entire career, man, there is so much that you've done and that you're continue to do for our country while you're serving now as the command sergeant major down in Special Operations Command Pacific. And I wish we had time on this episode to talk about some of the things that you've done for our career in the past and what you continue to do. But just for you, for Angel, for your family, man, I am immensely proud of who you are and what you stand for, Walt. And Thank you for giving me a little bit of time for this episode of Unbeatable. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. You know, like, um, and, and and honestly, you, you, you know, set the example for others to follow. That's that you know, as part of the creed. And I had I had men that were setting the example for me. There are men and women now that wear the tab that are in the in the yeah. regiment. And you, you know, you get to walk in the shadows of people, of and giants, then right shadows of giants and then i think if you got your compass pointed in the right direction you're trying to figure out how to one day be able to then cast your own shadow not so that you're a giant for the glory of it but so that you know you you're you're pulling the rest of that those people along someday just like you looked at people in front of you that that could set that example and and the whole experience of of you know, learning from from people like you, Jeff, and, and the other people in the best range of competition and people throughout the rest of my career, they they've been the, the people that have helped shape and mold me and, and, yeah. and get me to where, you know, I can I can serve now. And this is all about giving back at this level. You know, I'm, I'm serving just to continue to give back. I am thrilled that you continue to serve. And I, I should have said it at the beginning of the episode, but man, I'm proud of you. And thank you for all that you continue to do for our country. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. It's an honor. Absolutely. Yeah, great talking with you, man. Walt, I'm going to say it for you one more time, man. I am your biggest fan. And I am amazed at all that you have accomplished in the military. But I still stand impressed in all, frankly, of what you've accomplished in the best ranger competition for everybody that stuck with me through the whole episode i hope you heard a thing or two along the way about facing the unknown about giving it everything that you've got about trusting some of what you've been through in the past when you're about to face something that you're really anxious really nervous about i really do believe that there are some very powerful life lessons that you can learn from walt's conversation about the best ranger competition so I hope you were excited about this thing. And tomorrow morning, if you want to tune in, it starts early in the morning, usually about 6 a.m. Eastern time in the United States. And if you want to kind of follow the Best Ranger competition and see what these teams are going through, just watch the event at bestrangercompetition.com. Thank you for tuning in to this episode. I hope somebody found this podcast for the first time. I hope you were just in awe of Walt and what he's accomplished. And if you like what you heard today, why don't you go ahead and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform? Or if you are watching this thing on YouTube, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to our channel? You can also follow us on social media because there's a lot of people that are connected with this podcast and are connected with each other. So all you have to do is just go out there and search for at Unbeatable Podcast, and you'll find us on just about all of the social media platforms. But you're also going to find amazing people out there like Mackie Malkiel. Mackie, you are our fan of the week this week, and we want to just thank you for being so engaged, so supportive of this podcast. We want to tell you that you're awesome. That's why we're telling you you're the fan of the week this week. 
Thank you, everybody, that's out there and engaging with each other on social media. And one final way that you can stay connected to us, and this is totally free, and perhaps the best way to stay connected with us is to join what we call the Unbeatable Army. The Unbeatable Army is when I deliver content to you straight to your inbox. If you want to sign up, there's no commitment, there's no obligation, and frankly, it's totally free. But just simply go over to unbeatablearmy.com, put in your information, and I'll start sending you content, not just about the episodes that we do, but just some of my thoughts, and I'll deliver them straight to your inbox during the week. Thank you for joining me for this episode today, and I hope you tune in this weekend and watch live or check in throughout the weekend to the 2024 Best Ranger Competition. Hope you have a great week. See you next time. God bless. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Thank you.